Coagulation is turning liquid into a gel, like jello, uh, due to proteins in it that stick together. When you make jello, uh, you take proteins and you put them in the water and you cook them right, just right, and those proteins start sticking together in a matrix, forming a gel. That's what coagulation is. And a cascade is a waterfall. But notice, like when the water hits here, it splits up into several different directions. When the water hits there, it splits up into several different directions. And that's what a cascade is. Now, it'd be very simple if one activated two, which activates three, which activates four, which activates five, which activates six, which activates seven and eight and nine. So it doesn't work that way. All right. This is just to show you what a cascade is. All right. But what I wanted you to see from a cascade is only, notice by activating protein one, we've activated lots and lots and lots of protein six. All right. So I want you to keep that in mind. That's what's going on with a cascade is when we activate this, then we've activated lots and lots and lots and lots of that. And if we inhibit any one of these in the process, then this does not occur. Here is the endothelial cell lining inside of a blood vessel. And in this case, uh, there's damage to the endothelial lining, and this can initiate the coagulation cascade. All right. So damage to the endothelium has exposed something called tissue factor. That used to be called factor three, tissue thromboplastin. Well, tissue factor will activate something called factor seven, the most common coagulation factor in the blood. And by the way, these are made by the liver. Most of them are made by the liver. They're proteins that float around in the blood. And this factor seven has come in contact with the damaged endothelial lining and become activated. And so when you look at the coagulation factors, when they become activated, we call them A. Well, now that we have an activated seven, it can activate 10. And when it activates factor 10, that becomes factor 10A. And here in a little bit, we're gonna talk about factor 10A inhibitors, drugs that block 10A from doing anything else. All right, factor 10A will bind to factor five and activate it. And the two of them together might be called prothrombinase complex. All right, well that prothrombinase complex will convert prothrombin, formerly known as factor two, into thrombin. And thrombin is factor two activated. All right. Well, thrombin's very important. Thrombin is the most important endpoint of the coagulation cascade. One of the most important things that thrombin does is polymerize to bind together the fibrinogens. All right, fibrinogen is factor one, and we can take that fibrinogen and make fibrin. Fibrin is one of the most important parts of the thrombus, but thrombin not only causes uh, fibrin formation, it causes platelet aggregation as well. And it causes the platelets to become attached to the fibrin. And so now my platelets aggravated and they start uh, attaching to each other. And the platelets and the fibrin coming together were the main two components of blood clot. Platelets and fibrin. Now we're talking about heparin. Heparin is an antithrombin activator. All right, heparin binds to antithrombin 3. Antithrombin 3 prevents the activation of coagulation proteins, especially thrombin and factor 10A. Remember, factor 10A was essential in converting prothrombin to thrombin. And heparin interferes with those steps. Antithrombin is a serine protease inhibitor. And so any conversion of a coagulation factor that requires a serine protease is inhibited by antithrombin-3. And remember, these are naturally occurring systems in the body because your body's always making blood clot, and then when it's made enough blood clot, it needs to stop and break it down. And so antithrombin-3 is your body's way of stopping the coagulation cascade. So here's my antithrombin-3, and it prevents the activation of coagulation factors, not only thrombin, but 10A, and any serine protease. You'll hear it called a serine protease inhibitor, a serin. Well, when you bind heparin to antithrombin-3, its effect is 10 times. 
All right, so antithrombin-3 has 10 times the ability to interfere with the coagulation factors when it's bound to heparin. Right. So again, heparin binds to antithrombin-3 and increases its activity of thrombin-3 by 10 times. All right. So heparin is an antithrombin-3 activator. Its effect is immediate. Uh, we use it IV. It's only available IV. And we have to get a lab test to see how well the heparin's working. And so that's called a PTT, a partial thromboplastin time. Hello, heparin is an anticoagulant. It does cause a rare disorder called heparin-induced thrombosis. It causes hypercoagulation. So there are people out there, you give them heparin instead of it preventing blood clots, it causes blood clots. So be on the lookout for that. Protamine reverses heparin. Because protamine binds to heparin and terminates its action, protamine is the chemical antagonist of heparin. And be careful giving protamine to reverse heparin. Protamine uh, can cause hypercoagulability if it's given too much. And I've seen more bad outcomes from the use of protamine than I have seen from overdoses from heparin. Right. Lenoxaparin comes from heparin. Heparin is like a mixture of different molecules different heparins make up heparin. Lenoxaparin, Lovenox is one of them, and it's a, a fractionated heparin. They'll take the heparin and they'll purify it uh, and get a specific molecule from the heparin. They'll change it. It's called low molecular weight heparin. And it works just like heparin does. It binds to antithrombin-3 and increases its activity. However, it has more activity against thrombin and factor 10. So, anoxaparin has more activity against thrombin and factor 10 than heparin does. This is what's important for any of the low molecular weight heparins. Uh, they do not require lab monitoring. People on Lovenox do not need to have their PTTs checked every six hours. So, let's talk about the factor 10A inhibitors. Factor 10A inhibitors are going to interfere with factor 10A, so it can't bind to 5A and it can't activate thrombin. So some of the factor 10A inhibitors uh, you might see in use, uh, Rivaroxaban, Xarelto, Apixaban, Alequis, uh, Edoxaban is uh, Cervesa, and Fondaparinux is Erixtra. Right. And something interesting about the factor 10A inhibitors, and you'll see that little XA in the words of Rivaroxaban, and Apixaban, and Indoxaban. Uh, the factor 10A inhibitors are used to prevent blood clot and formation in people with atrial fibrillation. That's something that we'll talk about with cardiac rhythm. And the factor 10A inhibitors are more and more replacing warfarin Coumadin, which has traditionally been used to prevent blood clot formation, especially in people with atrial fibrillation. So let's talk about warfarin Coumadin. This inhibits the hepatic synthesis, the liver synthesis of vitamin K-dependent clotting factors, and that includes prothrombin, factor 7, factor 9, and factor 10. So again, instead of blocking factor 10 here, we're causing the liver to not synthesize factor 10 and some other clotting factors in the cascade. The key word here is vitamin K dependent. So warfarin coumadin is reversed with vitamin K, and the fancy word for that is phytonidione. phytonidione. Uh, but we still call it aquamphytin. You'll hear somebody who's coming into the hospital, we want to decrease the effects of Coumadin before surgery, maybe we'll give them some aquamphytin. People who take Coumadin, uh, sometimes they'll be told that they can't eat foods with vitamin K in it because the vitamin K reverses the effects of the Coumadin, like green leafy vegetables, spinach, and other greens. Uh, and it depends on how dependent they are on Coumadin. If they've had a heart valve replacement, it'd probably be a good idea for them to avoid this. In other situations, some of the physicians will allow them to eat green leafy vegetables as long as their intake is consistent and they check their PTI and R regularly. There are people out there who have PTI and R machines at home who eat whatever they want and they check their PTI and R, I and R just about every day so they can adjust their Coumadin. The lab to monitor Coumadin is the PTI and R. And so keeping an I and R about two for the average person is what we try to do. And we keep it higher for people with valve replacements. A cumin and warfarin affects the manufacture of proteins in the liver. That means it takes several days 
for the Coumadin to take effect. So today's Coumadin affect blood clotting two to seven days later. Okay, that's different than like heparin. Heparin's effects are immediate. So maybe somebody comes to the emergency room with a deep vein thrombosis, a blood clot in their leg. We'll put them on heparin immediately. Its effects are immediate. It doesn't dissolve the clot, but it prevents new clots from forming. All right, because then your body can break down the clot on its own. We'll put them on warfarin at the same time. We'll put them on heparin and warfarin at the same time. The heparin will start working immediately, and the Coumadin will start working anywhere from two, three, four, five, six, seven days later. Well, once the Coumadin starts working, once we've gotten effect from the Coumadin, we can stop the heparin. So the reason we have them on both is the heparin's gonna be IV, we're gonna have, they have to do that in the hospital, we're gonna check their PTT every six hours. We wanna get the Coumadin up to therapeutic effect so we can stop the heparin. Yes, the rumors are true. The Wisconsin uh, Research Alumni Fund uh, developed Coumadin to be a rat poison because they thought, well, if it interfered with these uh, clotting factors in a rat liver, uh, then they'd bleed to death. And so the rat poisons are called Coumarins, and they don't work very well, especially for rats in Hawaii. As long as we carefully monitor the PTI and R in the patient, then there are no ill effects. We can give them too much Coumadin to where they bleed excessively. We have to be on the lookout for people who have GI bleeds. Uh, one of the things about Coumadin that I want you to remember is it's a known teratogen. It does cause birth defects. It's absolutely contraindicated in women who might become pregnant. So the most common use for warfarin is to prevent blood clots uh, in atrial fibrillation. And this is the leading cause of stroke. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. When the atria fibrillate, they can form blood clots. And those blood clots will break loose and go to the brain, causing stroke. So atrial fibrillation is a leading cause of stroke. If somebody has a stroke or uh, a mini stroke, a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, one of the first things we'll do is get an EKG to see if it's caused by atrial fibrillation. So that's the most common reason for people to take Coumadin. And then the factor 10A inhibitors are being used as an alternative to Coumadin.